Um, we're going to start with Lisa Wittenborn, and her lights are back on. So Lisa is the executive director of the Rivanna Conservation Alliance, and she's going to provide an overview of the Rivanna River Resilience Partnership Program. So we'll let you take it away, Lisa. Great. Thank you. And thank you for joining us tonight. <clears throat> of course. And Erin, it's nice to see you. We have a long history of being in master naturalist training classes and crossing paths in strange places. Mm. Um, oh, I'm at the end of my presentation here. Let's see. All right. Everyone seeing it? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for having me here tonight. And um, apologies in advance if I get a little tongue tied. It's my second presentation of the day. So my brain is a little bit addled at this point. Um, but I'm really excited to talk about this topic tonight, which is, um, I thought about it after I, Christine and I were talking about um, the description of my talk. And I wanted to add a couple um, more things and to focus more broadly on um, Ravana River Resilience Project. So not just the, the partnership project, but some other things as well. So um, my first question is, does anyone know where this picture is taken? Does it look familiar to anybody? Is that the, uh, the boat uh, set place? Oh, I can't remember the name of it. Yeah, but the, they... it's the Ravana River Company. So this is on the Ravana Trail looking at their property. And um, second question, anyone have any idea how old those trees might be that are behind the fence in this picture? They're fairly new. I was gonna say 10 years or less. But behind the picture, yeah. Yeah, they're th in this picture, they're three years old. So those are trees that um, they were actually left over from a different buffer planting project that we, did it at a school and um, we put them here at the river company. They were bare root seedlings. So just little tiny baby trees put in in 2019. And this picture was taken in 2022. And just a few weeks ago, I saw a hammock strung up between two of those trees. So <laughs> I thought that was amazing. Um, they, they're really happy growing there. All right. So a little bit of background about um, my organization. So the Ravana Conservation Alliance is a pretty small nonprofit based here in Charlottesville. We have about three full-time staff and two half-time people. And we work with over a thousand volunteers each year to really extend our impact in the community. Um, we were actually formed in 2016 by a merger of two other organizations, the Ravana Conservation Society, which was formed in Fluvanna County in 1990 and Streamwatch, which was formed in Charlottesville in 2002 and was really focused just on water quality monitoring. So those two groups came together to form RCA and we have elements of both of their work in our current mission, which is to work with the community to conserve the Ravana River and its tributaries through water quality monitoring, restoration, education, and advocacy. And I always have to start every presentation just orienting us to the watershed. Um, so you can see on the left hand side, um, the larger green area is the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And then the Ravana watershed is the blue area down um, in Virginia. And on the right side, you can see that the Ravana watershed, um, it starts up in Shenandoah National Park. So our headwaters are up at Skyline Drive and coming down through Green County, Albemarle County and Fluvanna County and the entire city of Charlottesville is in the Ravana watershed. It's about 769 square miles. Um, and we have little bits of orange in Louisa as well, but mostly green Albemarle, Fluvanna and Charlottesville are the areas that we work in. So um, I like to show these pictures because I think they really help illustrate what makes a stream a healthy stream. So you can just look at these pictures and just make some observations. So what are you noticing that's different about the stream on the left versus the stream on the right? And feel free to shout out some- Erosion versus no erosion. I'm sorry, what did you say, trees? Erosion was one of the things I was thinking. Oh, erosion, that, yes. Yeah. yeah. And certainly the trees. Shading the water. Shading in the water. By the trees. Mm -hmm. 
the left your... the left stream is meandering and the right one has been channeled mm -hmm. and what about the way the water looks or what's under the water the left one has rocks so it gets more oxygen it's yeah. oxygenating the water better and the right one is just kind of no, dead no. water <laughs> exactly. yes and so a lot of those differences you're noticing have to do with the fact that the left one still has a forested riparian buffer and the one on the right does not. Yep. Um, so healthy riparian forests or riparian buffers, as a lot of people like to call them, um, mean healthier streams, typically. And there are a lot of things that help those healthy forests do for our streams, including stabilizing the stream banks. The roots of the trees really help hold the soil in place and prevent erosion. Those trees actually help filter pollution out of the water that's entering um, the stream from the sides. Um, somebody mentioned shading. That's really important for keeping the water temperatures cool. A lot of our fish species in particular can't survive in warm water like trout. They have to have cool water and that shading is critical for that. Um, the trees around the streams also provide the energy for the web, the web um, food web in the in the streams, sorry. Um, they contribute organic matter and that organic matter is basically the base of the food web in the stream. So if you don't have trees around a stream, you're going to have a really depleted um, life um, situation going on. So um, they also provide a lot of wildlife habitat, the trees for terrestrial organisms, and they're really important in helping recharge groundwater. So when you have a heavy rainstorm fall on a forest, most of that water is going to actually sink in. It's going to get absorbed by that leaf litter. It's gonna soak down into the ground and help recharge the groundwater. Um, that stream that we saw on the right here, if you have a really heavy rainstorm, most of that water is going to run right off of that compacted soil into the stream. And that's largely why you're seeing a lot of that erosion there because the water's moving quickly and has a lot of power to carry that soil away. When you have a healthy forest, it's slowing that water down, allowing it to filter down into the water. And that groundwater recharge is really important for protecting our streams, especially in the summer, because um, I don't know if any of you have ever wondered in you know, the heat of the summer, even in a drought, why we're still seeing water in our streams and rivers. Where's that water coming from? It's coming from the groundwater. So the base flow of our streams and rivers is actually shallow groundwater that's coming back to the surface. So if we stop that infiltration of water into the groundwater, that means that in the summer, there's less water coming back into the streams. So that's why in urban areas, we tend to have streams that we um, describe as flashy. So when it rains, the water comes into them very quickly, they rise very quickly. And in the summer or in dry periods, they're very low and dry because there's not that groundwater recharge helping to build them back up. So part of the reason that um, we care about these issues is not just because of the streams themselves, but because the healthy forests and streams and rivers help support a healthier community, a more resilient community. Um, so <clears throat> these healthy riparian areas provide a lot of flood resilience for our community by helping to absorb those floodwaters slow down the water velocity and reduce the erosion um, that can come from the really fast moving floodwaters. Uh, I know this is something you probably talk about a lot, but um, these areas can help really address urban heat island effects by not only shading the ground, but the evapotranspiration of the vegetation in the buffers also really helps cool down the air. And that um, can reduce cooling costs for our buildings. Um, these areas also really help improve our drinking water quality and that reduces treatment costs by filtering the pollutants out of the water before it gets to the treatment plant. Um, these trees also help reduce um, or improve air quality by absorbing and filtering different air pollutants like particulate matter, nitrous oxide, sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, ozone, the list goes on. Um, but they do make a really marked difference on air quality in our urban areas. 
And then last but definitely not least is these areas really provide an important place for our community to be able to enjoy the physical and mental health benefits of nature. And this is something that I'm sure you all have been reading more about as well, but there's more and more research coming out about how incredibly important it is for our mental health to spend time in nature and to feel connected with nature. So having these healthy systems within our urban corridor that people can access is really important for us. So what can we do to help increase the health and resilience of these areas, and especially focused in the urban Ravana River corridor? Um, so there's a long list of things we can do. The first three I have check marks next to you because those are the things that my organization um, is really working on and I'll talk about um, sp some specific projects in those areas. But of course we can work on planting new riparian forests. So in areas where there's not a sufficient riparian buffer, um, we can plant new trees and expand those buffers. Um, it's also really important to focus on protecting the trees that we do have. I do um, think sometimes we focus so much on planting new trees that we uh, don't pay attention to keeping the trees we have in healthy condition. And that's really an issue in our urban areas where a lot of trees are growing near um, utility lines like water lines and sewer lines that have setback requirements. So it's one thing I've noticed is that a lot of our utility partners, they um, don't mind trees that are there but they don't want you to plant new ones. So if we lose trees that are growing along our streams and rivers, which is where the sewer lines and water lines tend to be, we can't necessarily replace them in, in all locations. So it's really important to protect those um, forests that we have. Um, and we can also work on stabilizing and trying to address eroding riverbanks because that's a huge problem for um, safety and for water quality. Other things that um, groups are working on, we haven't gotten into these too much yet, are protecting and restoring wetlands, um, promoting stormwater infiltration through a variety of projects, and also reconnecting waterways to our floodplains. And this is a really important one in our region where we have these very deeply incised rivers and streams. If you've ever noticed where the banks are very, very tall and steep, and just denuded um, soil, that, that's what we call an incised stream, it's cut down. And in some cases that's coming from a lot of storm water that is actually, it's physically removing the material on the bottom of the stream and allowing that stream to cut further and further down. But another thing um, that is happening or has happened in a lot of our waterways around here is something that is called legacy sediments. Um, so it used to be that almost all of the area around here, the forest was cut down at some point. And there, of course, were no erosion control <laughs> rules in place. And so a lot of soil washed down towards our streams and rivers because they are in the low lying points in our topography. And that soil built up and our streams have simultaneously cut down. So that's a lot in a lot of places why you see these really tall, steep river banks and stream banks is actually because of the legacy sediments that are in those places. And what that does is have the effect of cutting those the water in the streams and rivers out of the floodplain. So if we have a flood event, that water is going to stay in the channel. It's going to move really fast and cause even more erosion. And we would like it to be able to spread out into the floodplain and slow down and soak in and infiltrate. So focusing on those first three things, I'm going to talk about a few of the projects that RCA is working on. Um, in terms of planting new riparian forests, um, the project that I wanted to mention to you all is um, something that came out of a study that we did in 2020 with a local consulting firm called Ecosystem Services. We actually um, got a grant to look at, at the five mile urban corridor of the river, which is an area that goes from the confluence of the North and South Forks of the Ravana, just North of Charlottesville down to Morris Creek. So that's what we define as the urban corridor of the river. And that project um, looked at riverbank erosion rates 
and then prioritized those areas based on where <laughs> restoration work would be most beneficial. And coming out of that, the number two project on our list was in the Dunlora um, Homeowners Association owned property on the river, which is a huge parcel of land. It's um, just north of Penn Park on the um, west side of the river. And it's an area that was cut for hay for a long time. It's a former plantation property. And then it's it was cut for hay. And then they kind of stopped cutting it for hay. And it's just become a pseudo meadow, but not in very good condition. And definitely there was a lot of potential for planting riparian buffers. There are two streams that go through there as well as the Ravana River. So we worked with the community and we were able to secure funding from the James River Buffer Program. And we um, designed and installed a nine acre tree planting project. So trees and tubes. Um, we had more than 20 different native species of shrubs and trees based largely on what was already growing there. So we picked species that already liked that um, particular climate. Um, and then we also worked with the Department of Forestry. There was an area where there was already some natural regeneration happening. So we didn't want to cut down those trees that were coming back on their own, but there was a lot of invasive pressure in that area. So we pulled the Department of Forestry in to do some treatment of the invasives and um, to, to kind of facilitate that natural regeneration process. And the way the community decided they wanted to do it was by planting some um, pine trees. So pine trees, as you might know, are um, an early succession, forest succession tree. So they come in early when there's a lot of light and then the hardwoods kind of come in behind them. So sometimes to promote regeneration, they'll plant pine trees and that just kind of kickstarts the process. The um, permanent forest will end up being a hardwood forest there. But this is a project that I'm really proud of and I'm really excited because the Ravana Trail runs through there. So it's accessible to the public and people will be able to see this mature and it will make a huge difference for um, water quality in those streams and in the river. Um, the second project I wanted to talk about, and this is the one that um, was described in the the description of my talk, um, <clears throat> it's called the Ravana River Resilience Project. And this is a project where we're really focusing on protecting and restoring our existing riparian forests. So it is um, basically a community partnership that's focused on um, doing this work. And we're working at kind of two different levels. Um, we're looking at that same five mile urban corridor, doing some GIS mapping and some kind of big picture assessments and prioritization for um, invasive um, management, I'm letting somebody into the meeting. Um, and then we're focusing um, on the ground work in Penn Park, Dardentau Parks, and Dardentau Park and Riverview Parks, um, focusing really on the um, forested parcels that are adjacent to waterways in those parks. So those are the areas that are highlighted in green. Um, and what we'll be doing in those areas is actually going in with volunteers to do field assessments of the forest canopy conditions and the presence and um, distribution of invasive vines, trees, and shrubs that are threatening the forest. So the goal of this is to protect the mature forest in those areas and fill in gaps in the forest with new plantings. And it's largely focused on dealing with the invasive um, vines and other um, woody species that are threatening those trees. I'm sure many of you have seen the trees that are just completely enveloped with vines and the vines are pulling the trees down, they're smothering them. And um, that's, that's what we're going after is trying to figure out where are the highest priority areas to protect and doing the work to protect them. So we have funding, we have a big grant to work on this and we um, will be working with a contractor and volunteers to go in and actually do invasive um, plant removal in those high priority areas. And then we'll be working with our partner groups to adopt different areas that have been treated to make sure that the invasives don't come right back, that they're managed long-term. And as I mentioned, we have um, some funding to also do some replanting um, of trees and shrubs where it's needed. This project also um, includes 
some workforce development funding. And this is something that we haven't quite figured out how we're going to do it, but we want to build our community's capacity to be able to do this type of work. There are very few contractors that know how to do this, um, are good at identifying their invasives, know how to treat things safely. Um, and we want to kind of build that up and also involve community members and give them an opportunity to develop some new skills, landscape skills that are gonna be in more and more demand as people start paying more attention to these issues. We also will be doing some um, research and outreach with other property owners in the river corridor, not just in the public parks where we're working, but reaching out to the private property owners to try to encourage um, cooperation among them and more work done on private property as well. Blue Ridge Prism is one of our main partners and they've been doing a lot of training in this area already. Um, the third project I wanted to talk about is um, another RRRP. All of our projects seem to be R's and P's. Um, the Rivanna River Restoration at Riverview Park project. <laughs> and this one also came out of that prioritization study. Um, Riverview Park ranked pretty highly as an area where riverbank restoration um, was needed and would have a lot of benefits. And so we selected that um, location as an area to try to actually put together a riverbank restoration project and secure funding to make it happen. So we've been working on kind of getting the groundwork um, in place for that project over the last couple of years. We completed um, last year a um, planning grant for this project that um, was supporting technical work and stakeholder engagement or community engagement work. So we want to find, or we want to design a project that is going to do the job we want it to do in protecting water quality and protecting the banks and holding up to flood events. We don't want to put something in there that's going to get washed away <laughs> next time a big flood comes through. So trying to figure out what is going to work there. And then we also want to have a project that the community wants to have there that's going to benefit the community. So that's, we've been working on that. So these are some pictures from Riverview just to give you a little bit more um, insight into what has been happening there and why this project was needed. Um, you can see at the top, this um, channel is actually, a, it started off as a fairly small stormwater channel coming in from the Woolen Mills neighborhood. I think it drains about 21 acres of land um, where there's basically no stormwater management. So the stormwater from that whole area is draining into the park through this channel and it's meeting with water that's coming in from the river. So when the river comes up, typically in the winter, it goes into this channel and it swirls around. And then when the river drops back down, it just takes a tremendous amount of soil with it. So we now have basically a ravine in Riverview Park, which is about 12 feet deep. It's completely undermined the Ravana Trail. You can see this little bridge um, in the background. That bridge has been moved probably four or five times. They just keep moving it further and further back as this channel's cutting into the park. Um, it's now getting very close to a sewer line that's owned by the Albemarle County Service Authority that actually uh, brings wastewater in from the county owned part of Woolen Mills, um, actually the Woolen Mills development. Um, and then right after that is going to hit the large sewer line that goes to the Ravana Water and Sewer Authority plant. So it's a pretty important project to protect those areas and public safety. Um, you can see the riverbank erosion in the, the bottom left picture there. That's very typical of what the banks look like. And you can see the large trees that are falling into the river. So um, one thing that we want to do with this project is try to protect the land, keep it from getting eaten up and protect as many trees as we can. And a lot of people get very nervous about stream restoration because it does typically involve removal of some trees but the trees that we would be removing in this project are already doomed. If you can see, they're basically, um, if you look at them from the water, they're very much undermined and going in anyway. So we need to try to stop that um, situation, arrest that erosion, and then replant 
so that the new trees can hold the banks in down the line. Um, and then that bottom right picture, I don't know if any of you recognize, that is what used to be the, the public access point at Riverview Park, and it washed away completely in a storm two years ago, never to be found again. That whole structure is somewhere in the Ravana River and no one has ever seen it. Um, I, I'm hoping we'll find it at some point. Um, but we hope to install a much more um, long lasting uh, river access point there that will, that will um, help protect the banks and not get washed away in the next storm. So these are just some snapshots of some of the different um, engineering and technical studies that were completed to figure out what would work in Riverview Park. And if you have any questions about some of these technical pieces, I'll probably refer you to our partners at Ecosystem Services because they this was their part of the project. But um, they did look back at old aerial imagery to see how the river has changed over time. They did a lot of modeling. Um, we pulled in our data from that prioritization study that's at the bottom left there, the erosion rate map that we created. They did topographic surveys, and we also went back to that drone survey we had done in the prioritization study. And then to figure out what the community wants, we did a lot of uh, community engagement. We collected input from about 250 people. We had two different public meetings. One was online, one was in person. We put forms in Riverview Park at our kiosk so people could fill the form out at the park and drop it into a drop box for us. Um, we also had an online um, survey going and then just a lot of conversations with people in the community. And what we gathered from all of that is that people were really in support of this project. They want to protect Riverview Park and they want to improve it. Um, the things that they were most concerned about were protecting the trails, um, having a safer and better river access, um, keeping the park natural, and then helping protect water quality. And the things that they really wanted to see improved kind of go along with those same things. They wanted to reduce erosion, stabilize the banks, um, they wanted to get rid of the invasive plants and plant more native things, improve river access, um, have better trash management and more education and public awareness. And then the top concerns we heard were about tree loss. As I mentioned, uh, people were nervous about having more impervious surfaces near the river, which is understandable. Um, and they're worried about invasive plant management and longevity of the project, which is why we were doing all of that engineering analysis to make sure that we are designing a project that's going to be long lasting. So this is our conceptual plan for the park, um, which may be a little bit hard to see on your screens, um, but it basically involves um, recontouring the riverbank so that it, it is not as steep. It will have a much shallower slope, especially in that middle area where you see that thing called a floodplain bench. That area is, um, I think it is a, I can't remember, three to one slope. Um, and that trail that kind of meanders down um, would be, it, it would almost be um, an accessible trail. It's, it's a fairly flat trail down and we'll have some boulder seating. And um, we will have an accessible overlook of the river, which is something that we do not have right now. Um, we'll have some more natural trails, a lot of planting going on. And then you can see on the left-hand side where it says outfall restoration, that's that very deeply incised channel I was showing you pictures of. So we would create, um, a feature called step pools there, which is basically like rain gardens <laughs> that step down. So there are almost like little rock walls between them and that helps um, prevent erosion of the water coming in from the river and the water coming back down out and, um, and creates just an attractive feature as well. And then we're proposing to move the boat launch to the other side of that outfall so we can make room for that accessible overlook. Um, it would also involve these features called rock veins, which are kind of like low rock walls that jut out a little bit into the river. They go upriver. And what they do is help direct a little bit of the flow away from the banks and towards the middle of the channel. So those um, 
would go in to help just protect, to further protect the um, restoration work and the vegetation that we would be planting. So long-term, the thing that will hold those riverbanks in is the trees, but you have to give the trees time to get established and get their roots in place and grow large enough to do their job. And so those rock veins really help buy time for those trees to get established and, and do that. So we um, have applied for a very large grant to make this project happen. Um, unfortunately, the funder is having some issues, so we won't hear about it for a while, but we're still hopeful. Um, and the city of Charlottesville already has funding to be able to do the outfall restoration. So that's going to happen one way or another. Um, and we will be looking, even if we get the large grant from the um, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, we'll still need to raise some additional funding for um, to match that and for some of the amenities. For example, the um, accessible overlook is not something that the funder we applied to would pay for because it's not a water quality improvement. That's something that we would need to find other sources of funding for. Um, but if we are able to hear back from the funder soon and it's a go, then our hope is to be completing final design of the project and permitting next year into 2025 and then constructing it in the fall and winter of 2025. Um, also in that proposal for the restoration project, we wrote in some funding for relief to be able to put some green teams in the Woolen Mills neighborhood. So in addition to dealing with that stormwater outfall by stabilizing it, we want to also be working in the community, planting trees to help um, promote infiltration of some of that stormwater before it even gets to the park, along with all the other benefits that would come from those urban street trees. So that's what I wanted to talk about and I'm happy to take any questions. <clears throat> Great. Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, so we have time for a few questions. Um, does anybody have anything they want to ask? I don't know. I would, I would like to just thank you so much for your presentation. And it seems like the Rivanna water and sewer, like they have an interest in protecting those sewer lines. And I'm wondering are there other sources of funding to address some of these problems? I get that the grant doesn't come through. Um, other ways of, it affects so many different, the parks, Almond County parks and so many different yeah. aspects. Yeah, so we um, we do have a commitment from um, RW, RWSA to put some money into the project, but it's not nearly enough to pay for the whole project. And we're trying to get Albemarle County Service Authority also to chip in a little bit. Um, so that would help the city. Uh, the money they have for the stormwater outfalls coming from their sustainability folks. But we um, have been talking with the Parks Department about putting in um, a CIP request potentially for this project. Uh, we kind of got delayed because of the funding situation with the the grantor that we're applying to. But if that doesn't come through, we definitely will have some other um, other funders that we can look to. This is kind of an unusual project though, because most stream restoration work happens on much smaller streams. And this one is, it may make some funders a little bit nervous. Um, it will not, it will definitely generate a lot of pollutant reductions, which is important, but it won't be as cost effective potentially as working on a small stream. But that's okay for us because that's not the only thing we're trying to get out of this project. We want that to be a key element, of course, but that's not the only goal of our project is the most cost effective pollutant removal. So um, it'll take some work to, to cobble the money together, but I feel like we will be able to do it. We had a lot of community support for this idea. Great. Uh, Bob, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> a couple of thoughts. One, has there been any modeling in terms of some, you know, of extreme storm and heavy flooding that has hit various areas, uh, you know, and as hit Charlottesville in the past, as to how that flooding will affect this project, 
and uh, how this project will affect that kind of flooding? Yeah, th those are good questions. Um, so typically, when engineers design projects like this, they don't have to be very conservative. They they only look at smaller storms, which is a problem. And it's something that we were um, thinking a lot about. So when the engineers were doing the analyses, they were doing kind of a sensitivity analysis and looking at some of those larger scale storms and what might happen. And so we, we would plan a project that will be very robust, much more than is typically required. Um, this project will help reconnect the floodplain a little bit in that area, but it's not a huge area of riverbank that we would be working on. It's about 600 linear feet. So it probably wouldn't have a marked impact on downstream flooding. But if we were to do this type of work along a you know longer reach of the river, it would probably make a bigger difference. Um, one thing that I'm, I want to be careful about is we don't want to create a project where all of a sudden downstream people think they have no flood risks anymore because that's not, that's not, you know, it's not that big of a project to, to make that much of a difference. Hopefully the city will acquire the land that had, there was recently a subdivision that was right in the floodplain just uh, south of um, the free bridge uh, a development that was going to put a large parking lot there. Mm -hmm. And hopefully the city will acquire that land. So you can do the similar things there. That is my dream, honestly, is to do this at, from Riverview Park up to that area. I think it would be amazing. Um, there's a lot of potential for it and it would make a really big difference for our community in a lot of ways. So that's my long-term dream, <laughs> including <laughs> that property you're talking about, but uh, hopefully the city is seriously considering trying to purchase that. Thank you for this valuable information. Mm -hmm. Peter, you have a question? Yeah, just a quick question. What's the uh, situation like uh, for of the stream bank in um, Fluvanna County? Um, it it varies. There are some places where it looks just as bad as it does up here. It's very steep and in size. It tends to be around bridges or areas where there are no buffers. And you can, if you ever paddle the river, you can really see the difference in the riverbank where there's a property where they are potentially cutting hay right up to the edge of the river um, versus one where they have a healthy forest. Um, so it it really varies like it does up here, but I think the urban corridor is has more consistent steep banks and erosion than other parts of the river do. Thanks. Um, well, thank you, Lisa. That was really, really informative. And it sounds, yeah, let's, let's give you a round of applause. Um, I mean, it sounds like, you know, you have a huge amount of work to do. Uh, with all the different projects and a pretty, I guess my question is you have a pretty small staff mm -hmm. and is there any uh, plan like a uh, long range plan of expanding your office or um, I mean, I know you rely a lot on volunteers, but um, just long range planning. What are you all thinking? Well, we've actually grown a lot since I started with RCA. I started part-time in 2017. We only had one full-time person who was the director okay. and a couple of part-time people. So we we have been growing. Um, I'm mindful that we're not a huge watershed. So I think there is an upper limit as to how large our organization um, can and, and should get. Mm -hmm but it is hard to say no to things. There are so many issues and so many things we want to be working on. So we definitely feel a little bit stretched at times, but our volunteers and our um, board of directors and other folks are very helpful. And we are relying more and more on partnerships. We really mm -hmm. do collaborate with a lot of other nonprofits and local governments and um, different groups to make sure that we're all kind of rowing in the same direction. And that helps a lot with getting the work done. Great. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you again. And maybe your talk will bring more volunteers to your organization. We'll pass the word out and <laughs> tell about the great work that you're all doing. So thank you very much for joining thank us you. tonight. Okay. Appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. Thank you.